Hello and welcome again to The Extra Point. I am here in Nashville, Tennessee with my good friend, songwriter, Barry Dean. Barry, first of all, appreciate you joining me. It's an honor. I'm excited to do this. You know, Barry, you and I struck up a friendship, I want to say five or six years yeah. ago. It was really, really cool. I, I, I was first introduced to you by, for me, the first song that I realized you, you wrote, which was uh, Girls Chase Boys by oh. Ingrid Michaelson, which I still think is a fabulous uh, tune. And, and She's fairly easy on the eyes as well, um, and, and you've told me about her. Just a great person. She's wonderful, but, yeah. Um, you're from Pittsburgh, Kansas. That's right. I That's work right. at Pittsburgh State University. You've yes. you've been a gorilla at one point. Yes. I, I am a gorilla as well. Um, but now you're writing in Nashville. It's a close knit group. Just talk to me first in terms of how you got out here and how that came to be. I we started. Uh, I. I I had always wanted to be a songwriter, mm -hmm. and um, and so I did music when I was very young, and then kind of explored that. And by the time I was twenty, I had stopped doing music, and so I still privately played with music. I would, you know, I had gear and some mm -hmm. things, and I would mess with it, but I I really didn't pursue it, and I kind of let that go. and And I think it kind of spun me out, honestly. I think if right. you you know, uh, the way I left it and all. But so, so I really was not the guy at the party who was writing songs or playing yeah. songs. I, I was just quietly keeping a journal and thinking about it. I'd play my parents' piano when I was over. And then when I got in my 30s, I married Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were looking at what, what should I do? You know, should I stay at the company? Should I move somewhere else? And, and um, she basically said, you know, what was your, what's your passion? Yeah. And uh, just to be honest, I laughed and said, you know, that's not how we're going to make this decision. We need to be smart about it. Right. And she thankfully kept pushing me. But what did you want to do? What did right. you really desire? And so I finally admitted, you know, I really wish I had pursued songwriting. That's what I really loved. And I think one of the reasons I didn't was when I was young. I was, I, there were lots of things it seemed I could do. Right. I could play sax or I could play keys or I could be session or I could do that. And I think if I had explored that further and really gotten to the root of, you know, what is it that I love, mm -hmm. then I would have found songwriting and, and uh, but I, I hadn't done that work yet. So <clears throat> having told her that, uh, she was surprised, first of all. Right. Like, are you writing songs now? Oh, in my journal, when I'm mowing the yard, that kind of thing. I don't write them down. I just write a song as right. a way of passing the time and a way of processing the world. Okay. Uh, that's oh, interesting. That's how I realized I was a songwriter was I, and, and differentiated it from uh, anything else, singing or playing or any other right. pursuit. Um, it is how I process the world. Even, you know, today, if, if there's, when I'm happy, I tend to write things down and process it as songs. That's how I interact with the world. Yeah. And um, I had never thought of that until I read an article around that time. Uh, I think it was in Performing Songwriter Magazine, and I think Amy Grant said it, of all people. And... Um, and I thought, that's, that's me, that's me. So she comes to me, I'm gonna say a month later, it may have been two months, and she says, will you take me on a cruise for our anniversary? And I did my part in the relationship, I said yes. And uh, yes, of course, and um, she goes, it's this one. And the Nashville Songwriters Association had done a, did a cruise with about seven or eight top level songwriters, Hugh Prestwood, Craig Wiseman, okay. Angela Cassidy. And, um, so uh, I couldn't get out of it. So we went. I, I finally, the last day, they asked me to play a song. So I had a CD of a 10-year-old song. Uh, and my friend Byron Funk there in Pittsburgh helped record uh, a newer song. I had two songs, an old 10-year-old song and a newer song. And he helped record those there. And, um, and I played them for him. And so then they said, I tell you what. Why don't you, uh, there's a thing coming up in a month, mm -hmm. a song camp kind of thing. Why don't you come to town uh, and come to that song Which camp? Which is Nashville, right? It's in Nashville. Okay. So, so I started making trips between Pittsburgh, Kansas, and Nashville, Tennessee in my 30s. Wow. And uh, so I was probably around 34-ish. Okay. Right in there, and uh, maybe a little <clears throat> younger. I think 34. And uh, did that for a few years. And then after a couple of years, and I started taking guitar lessons. Right. And Jen Schott, our mutual <clears throat> friend, was yeah. here already. My wife, Jennifer, had cheerleaded with Jennifer Schott. Jennifer Schott's dad had been my professor. I forgot about that part Pitt of it, State. yes. He was, he was a great uh, professor at, in McRae at, at mm -hmm. Pitt State. And, and so 
we started making those connections, and after a couple of years, I want to say three actually, um, I got signed to my first publishing deal at BMG, which was right. unheard of. And, um, and so I stayed in Pittsburgh another 18 months or so, because I still was like, I don't, this is crazy. Right. right. And um, so risky. It would mean selling it all, starting over. Yes. Uh, it was really hard for me. But how, I mean, I've heard this story before, obviously, but to me, there's so many beautiful parts of this, but the one being your spouse, your wife, understanding what you want to do and then not only understanding them, but pushing you towards that. I think we all in life need somebody like that. I mean, yeah. how lucky is it for you that you're married to that lady and Jen? Of course, I've, <laughs> I've been able to be around her and just a, a fabulous person, but that is so awesome. Yeah, very rare. You know, most people hear the story uh, of a, a songwriter or a musician, and they say, oh, what did your wife think? Or what did your spouse right. think? And uh, the, the true story of this is, even after I was signed at BMG and had Martina had a single on the radio, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I was still going, this is too risky. Let's stay in Pittsburgh. Wow. And it was Jennifer that was like, you're crazy. Our daughter needs to be nearer a children's hospital. Right. It's great education opportunities for Alex, our oldest. Uh -huh. And she was like, I, this is the time. So, so when we had that famous, you know, stereotypical argument of the, you know, go, go or no go on this creative venture, I was actually the one arguing to stay. Wow. Um, most people assume it went the other way. It wasn't that way at all. Jennifer's very creative and very, um, you know, she's, she's very like, not, she's not afraid. She does no, not and She likes to write, I think. She is a, she's that. a great writer. Yes. And she just, but she really, you know, for her, it was a, a very simple equation. This is something that seems to give life to you. This is something that you want to pursue. And she saw it. I'm, I can't speak for her exactly, but she really saw it as this is the example you need to set wow. is to pursue things mm -hmm. that you believe you are meant to do. That's what you want our kids to see. And she saw it very fundamental like that. Right. And um, and uh, and she was right, I think. That's a great life lesson for anybody, though, in yeah. terms of I, I think we all feel like we've got some gift. And I mean, for whatever reason, we don't go after. So I think that's beautiful. Now you brought up um, a little bit of the fact of, of your daughter, Catherine, yes. which, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but she was the inspiration, I think, for one of your first songs that was recorded. That song. Was that God's Will? God's Will. Yeah, God's Will. It's, it, the song yeah. is about a little boy, but but it was literally taken directly from my journals. I, I had the title. Uh, she was born 16 weeks early, pound mm -hmm. 10 ounces, at, uh, in Joplin, Missouri, and at uh, Freeman. And, um, and then later we were sent, uh, she was flown to St. Louis, you know, for uh, surgery, brain surgery. And, and um, it was Christmas and we were in, in St. Louis. And um, I can't remember who said it, but someone said, well, we don't know what's going on, but we know it's God's will. And I had been, um, wow. I had been raised in, uh, in church and love it. And, um, but there were certain elements of my upbringing that I was wrestling with and still mm -hmm. do. And, and as I was walking into the NICU with Jen, Christmas Eve, I was walking alongside Jen and I said, well, look, Jen, there's, I think the guy's name was Ishmael, but it, it was a little boy in mm -hmm. a ventilator. I said, well, there's God's Ishmael and there's God's. And Jennifer was like, what is that? You know, what is that thing that causes you to, why am I poking that? Something's bothering you, right? Wow. And so, and I was like, you're right. So I grabbed my journal, because we would sit there. I would hold Catherine and sit by her in the NICU mm -hmm. until three in the morning or whatever. Yeah. So I wrote, I just wrote everything out. I'll tell you what it is. You know, it's, it's this and that, and how would you know, and this and that, and, you know, I've wrestled with this, and I've da da da, da and I just wrote. I bet, I bet it's six pages, maybe eight, um, in my journal. And, um, Flash forward from there over a year. Yeah. Um, I'm, I f get my first chance to write with Tom Douglas, who is a king songwriter, Hall okay. of Fame songwriter. And um, he wrote House That Built Me and okay. a Little Rock and a bunch of songs. And um, so we sit down and I throw him every clever country idea that I think he would like. Right. And he doesn't. 
bite. He's, he's just like yawn. He doesn't yawn, but he could yawn. And uh, <laughs> then he says, let's go to lunch, uh-huh. which was kind of code for you failed. You know, you know, you've failed to anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's that. It's like, oh no. So we went to lunch and we had a great visit and he's been a great teacher. And but we came back from lunch, he said, let's go back inside for a minute, which I couldn't believe I got another shot. Right. right? And we sit down and uh, he said, any other ideas you've been kicking around? At the bottom of my stack of ideas, which was this thick, you know, yeah. papers, bottom, is one piece of paper that has a few notes about God's will. And then, of course, my journal is always in my briefcase. Was it at the bottom because it's so personal? It was, yeah. It's yes. so personal. Yes. It, it, well, I also knew that that could never work. It's not commercial. It doesn't follow the rule. I mean, that's not what we're looking for, right? Okay. So this is the era of redneck woman and songs like that. Mm-hmm. So it, it, I knew... I thought I knew. Right. I knew what would work and what wouldn't work, and that's not one that works. That's too personal. It's too this. It's too that. Interesting. It's down at the bottom. And so in that moment, I reached down to the bottom and pulled it out. And I think it was because I had exhausted my supply of silliness. <laughs> gotcha. The, I basically had done everything I could do right. on the, this side of the armor. Understood. And uh, so then I said, well, I have this one song idea about God's will and he's like what and I was like it's this boy and you meet him and he changes things and it's really kind of based on my daughter and what she will or won't do and those kinds of things and he said hand me whatever you have and so I wow. handed him that and I still was holding you know and so he plays for a minute and then he kind of looks at me and he said but it's really about the struggle yeah and I said well and I pulled my journal out and I showed him the journal, and he's holding it on the piano, and finally I just tore the pages out of the journal, spread them on the piano, and I say in that moment, Tom Douglas taught me how to write songs. Wow. Because suddenly, I wasn't trying to write for the radio or the label or you were my publisher. From your heart. We were, yeah, we were you, just you trying. You became completely vulnerable. Yes, we're gonna tell the story. This, and, and I will tell you, my first two songs that were recorded, one was called Moving Olita, it violates all the structure rules of songwriting. It's not hooky. It's sad. It's depressing. I thought no one would like it. Reba cut it. That led to my co-write where we wrote God's Will. And I remember as they both those albums came out saying to Jen, if it hurts this bad to write every song, oh wow, I don't know if I can do it. Yeah. Well, I, this you know? is, I, I'm, I'm in tears twice today already. <laughs> and, and this is early. I, I get moved. It isn't amazing how as you get older, to me, yeah. um, emotion bubbles up so emotion much more. Emotion and passion. You know, yes. some of it is, sometimes yeah. I find I get the most emotional when I hear a story where someone has uh, done something uh, where they put themselves on the line. Right. Where they, you know... Uh, Don Schlitz, the great writer, wrote to the gambler. Oh, he would always say, uh, "People like to see another person make the right choice. People like to see the other person struggle because it helps us know that we're not alone." Yes, and, he, and I think there's truth in that. Right. So, so. I mean, that's kind of a weird segue, but it, it, it made it, that made me think. Okay, diamond rings and old old bar stools going right. back and forth. This was one that you were, I think, Grammy nominated That's for. Right. That That's uh, right. was was it Tim Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw yeah. wrote. Uh, you wrote that for him with him. We we wrote you, it. Uh, we didn't think of him. We, he thought of it. I mean, it was so country at that time. That wasn't really what was on the radio. It was really right. poppy, and so we thought maybe George Strait. Okay. And I uh, went on hold for George Strait through the label, and it looked like maybe he was going to cut it, and then he didn't. And we honestly thought, well, that's, that's the only option, right? That's the only person who would have cut it. Interesting. And McGraw's people heard it. I think Missy Gallimore heard it and took it to McGraw maybe. And, and he heard it and cut it. And, you know, he's an incredible picker of songs and yeah. timing of things. Uh, I think McGraw, his career is one that every artist ought to study because, I mean, he, he, since the 90s, he has been important to this genre. Right. And that's not true of everybody. You know? No, exactly. Well, I, I would think, you know better than I, but um, 
staying relevant, not, not just making it in this business, but staying relevant. And this is completely off the, the radar, but the one person that comes to mind for me, I know it's, it's odd, but in a different genre, Paul Abdul stayed relevant for Found a way. decades. Yeah. And I've always, I, I've always recognized that. and like, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, but that's what we're talking about with, with Tim as well. And yeah, no, I know Tim and Paula are two different. But, know, but they are people who have <clears throat> navigated the the environment they're in and right. found where do I go now? What do, well that may mean I change my approach. Yes. It may change this or change that. And also, and I don't know her, but I, Tim McGraw has been, I know, very good about nurturing new artists and helping, you know, giving them advice that maybe he didn't get the benefit of. And Does, so. Is so? I mean, you've obviously been around him and everything. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like he's a very empathetic soul then. Uh, yes. I mean, he's a, uh, he's a class act. He's the guy, he's one of the guys you want to be. You know, when you're around him, you kind of go, yeah. okay, well. And, and you know, he's not... Uh, you know, our, well, we are we are about eight days difference in age, which just tells you how how great a shape he is in, because no one would believe that. I wasn't but, going there. But uh, I caught everything that he lost. And uh, <laughs> but no, he's an intense. But I will say this: he is he's a very Taurus. He's an intense dude, and um, he works very very hard. It's not an accident that he has had so much success. And uh, I mean. He's put in, he's still right now putting in time yeah. and, and doing, and even if you look at even his acting career, I really, I made a joke once to somebody that my sons would grow up when they were little and say, Tim McGraw, the actor, was a singer? Oh, wow. Right? I mean, now the truth is he's still relevant. Right. And, and a hit, fabulous one. Yeah. But you know, what I hear you say also is it brings to mind somebody you work with and you write with, who, which is in Creative Nation, which we'll talk about later, Lori McKenna. I yeah. believe she wrote Humble and Kind. And yeah. what you're telling me is that song describes him. I know that's yeah. not... No, and I think as, as she said once, she was looking out the window when she wrote that at breakfast, which I, yeah. is a whole other story. But um, to me, that encompasses him from what you're telling me. Yeah. And he's, again, he makes those big calls. That song is a very particular song, right? And a lot of people might not have cut it, but he gets it. He gets it at a molecular level, right? He, and I would say, you know, keep in mind, uh, it was Faith and Tim that brought Lori McKenna, thank the Lord, to Nashville and to prominence right. in country music. She was obviously very successful in Boston with yes. Bitter Town and and in that folk circuit up in in that area. But Faith heard, as I understand it, Faith heard Bitter Town. Uh, that album that Lori did, and was just like, who is this woman? And and honestly, I don't know uh, what would have happened next. And but I think the world would have been not as cool if Faith hadn't and Tim hadn't done that. Faith brought her into Nashville, cut a bunch of her songs. Tim produced a record on Warner Brothers. They took her out on the Soul to Soul tour, wow. and she made fans all over the country. Uh -huh. And I think she was this unique you know i like to believe someone that unique and special like lori would have had the same day in the sun but i know that they did she did because of tim and faith and, and their wow. involvement so now you talk about unique and special and granted I, i'm a homer because it's who i know but creative nation beth laird luke laird lori mckenna i think natalie Hemby. she maybe. was there she's at but, universal well, now but some, she's okay, one of I the apologize, family no but, she's one but, of the family but just a, a lot of these folks i mean the number ones that you've thrown out i mean you've you've thrown out um you've you've had four number ones i believe four number correct? ones and diamond rings wasn't a number one right but it was yeah, but it was, it was but it was five. grammy nominated yeah right? top five which grammy. is not bad yeah, so I, I no complaints yeah um you, but you wrote had 24 number ones, well you know we'll, we'll get to that <laughs> oh, that's okay but but uh you've been in some of those i mean you, yeah. you wrote pontoon i think yeah, for a little, little uh, big town and yeah one other for maybe day drinking for a little big Day drinking was a Troy Verges, but yeah, oh, okay. I did. but that was for a little big town. That's that right. one, yeah. okay. And then I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, oh, think a little less. Think a little less with, for Michael Ray, right, which you were kind enough to invite me out to the number one uh, yes. party, uh, which was, uh, which was so eye opening because as you said, country music's the only, really, the only one that does it like this, which yeah. I think is neat. The funny thing also was when I was out here and. You said, well, I wrote it with a group of guys, and there's a couple of people, and you said, and I wrote it with another guy, actually, who, who, 
who's pretty big, Thomas Rhett. I didn't know Thomas <laughs> Rhett. Yes, I know. I didn't know Thomas no, Rhett. No, he was just on the ascent. He was he on was, the ascent. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. But I remember coming home and telling my boys about that or whatever. And yeah, he said, he also wrote with somebody called Thomas Rhett. Uh, apparently, he sings also. And they're just looking at me like, <laughs> Dad, come on. Yeah. Oh, he's so, so great. Yeah. But um, but yeah, you, you talked about Luke. Luke has had uh, multiple number number ones. L yeah. Laura has been, uh, or um, Laurie McKenna. Yeah. I mean, songwriter of the year. I mean, it goes on yeah. and on and on. And um, this brings me to a, a point maybe in the show where I think it makes sense. And it's the power of gratitude. You know, what are you mm. grateful for? And, and I, it's probably some of those things. But I'm just curious, in your career, uh, be it events, be it people, uh, what's some things that really stand out to, to you and that you are grateful for? Well, I, this just happened this week, so it's in my mind right now. Okay. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I went to Pittsburgh Middle School. And there was an English teacher there named Kathy Abishan. Her oh, husband was General Jim. Abishan. Yeah, Jim Abishan. Oh, yeah. yeah really. And uh, so I'm an eighth grader, and uh, I wanted to be a great athlete. And I was not a great athlete, and nor was I a very driven guy. I was, I was not, you know, if I had done the work, I think maybe something better. Never would have been talented at it, but I, okay. I might have been able to find my way. Um, we were doing writing assignments in English. I never thought of myself as very good at school, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but, but those years, seventh and eighth grade specifically, were really influential. I look at, as a 53-year-old, I look back. Because uh, Mr., uh, Steve Harry, Mr. Harry, was uh, the band director. And he had played in jazz ensembles and he toured the world you right. know, as a Trump. He was a world famous trumpet player. And he's now, I think, at Fort Scott Community College, or maybe he's retired, but he was a wonderful man. And that was something that applied music to the real world, to records, to, he really broadened my, my understanding of music, taught me so much. And, and I was kind of the band nerd with him. And then the other thing that happened during that time, Mrs. Abishan was the English teacher at Pittsburgh Middle School. And I remember we did some writing assignments and I wrote something. I think, I think we had to pick a, a person in the class and write about mm -hmm. it. And I may have picked her. Okay. And I, I don't know why. I don't remember a lot about it, but I remember that at that time in my life, what I wished I was, the who I wish I was, was I wish I was an athlete. I thought that would fix all my problems. Kind Interesting. Of. I was pretty... Uh, not sure of myself and yeah and um, so uh, she called me out in the hall when we turned our papers in she'd read it and she got very emotional and she said I need to tell you something that I don't know that I've ever told somebody else but may maybe once but uh, I think you're a poet wow and I didn't really know what that was. You know, you, mm -hmm. you can imagine an eighth grader in Pittsburgh, Kansas. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what she just called me, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, a po I'm a poet and I didn't realize it. <laughs> I didn't realize it, I guess. That's a better way to say it. And, and I really, you know, I, I, there was a part of me that it wasn't like it is now where everybody has sort of a, a title or a, right. a thing. At that time, you really had just a few roles you could be, mm -hmm. you know. And poet wasn't one that I'd ever heard of. Right. I wasn't sure what that meant, you know. Did that, and so I did not. Um, I'm sure I said thank you, uh, but I didn't really take it to heart. Right. But when I went further down the road, and especially when I came back to writing songs in my 30s, it was that moment that told me I could. Because who's going to give you it the never license? Left, it never it left. Never left. Either she gave me permission yes. to be that. She, she spoke it into me. And so that was a big moment. And at the same time, uh, there was a woman, uh, she still is, uh, Mrs. Bowie, uh, Joella Bowie. Um, she taught choir at the eighth grade of Pittsburgh Middle School. I was not in the choir. I wow. was in the band. It's too shy. Could not. Which is interesting because I've heard you sing, and I know you're going to show it. But you're a very good singer. Well, thank you. I yeah, I I was very uh, uh, self conscious. Yes. No. I get that. And uh, so, but I could play the piano. So I would play for the other folks that were friends of mine to audition for the select choir and yeah. those kinds of things. And she coerced, she, she and a friend, Jody Richter, a uh, singer, uh, 
sort of tricked me into auditioning, being stuck in the room, and then the woman saying, well, you sing it. Oh, I don't sing. Well, just sing it for me so I know what it's going And they did a little thing in eighth grade. And it, so, so that time for me, which I would not consider if you said it was eighth grade a great year, I would say, no, it was not. Right. But, but in, rea- in, in looking back now, mm-hmm. Mr. Harry is going, there's lots of kinds of music. Yes. I'm going to show you how to play all these different instruments. Right. Um, I'm going to broaden that musical horizon. Meanwhile, uh, Miss Abishan is planting this seed in me that you, you are a poet. Well, that's a crazy thing, right? I don't even know. Still today, I don't know if I right. can fully. Now I see it as a very sacred thing. Yes. Then I saw it as the opposite of football. You know, I mean, and, right. and I was really not having her basketball. And, and then Mrs. Boy opened the door for me to sing. So those three teachers in that year, that's not something I've talked about a lot, but I have been thinking about it during the shelter in place. I've been thinking about it a lot, like how important, and, I, and a friend from uh, that, from middle school and high school, uh, just out of the blue, sent a picture to me that she had taken in eighth grade of me standing with Mrs. Abishan. Wow. I, I plan to get that picture for this. Yeah, That'll yeah, be great. I'll, I'll get Very it for cool. You. So that's just happened, and I've just been thinking about them a lot, and um, um, so I'm very grateful for them, and I, I then, you know, I would say there's just so many people. In fact, I think this is something very special that you do because I think gratitude helps you see it, it's so valuable what you're talking about. And, and so the, if, if we know it's the cure for a lot of negative yes. things. You know, but, and, <laughs> and literally, there's studies been done, a um, uh, gentleman uh, out of Cal Davis, where if you express gratitude on, on, a, on, on a daily basis, weekly basis, you get more uh, help out of it uh, than, than actually the people that you're, you're telling thank you I to, which that. I think is I phenomenal. Well, in, in our, well, you and in, in all the areas, and in, in business is the <clears> same. <throat> in music business, oftentimes, you know, I said it earlier, I said, oh, he's had 24, I've only had four. Right. And Lori's only had however, six or whatever yes. she's had. The, the fact is, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, how do you deal with it? We're all super competitive. Right. We're all super, uh, frankly, uh, insecure. Mm-hmm. Uh, as writers and musicians, um, we are tend to want approval. Mm-hmm. You know, so we're driven by these things that could really lead to some poisons. And I, I have friends who've struggled with that. When a friend of theirs gets a hit, they're miserable. They they go dark. Right. Um, but Lori, you've been around her. Lori never does. Luke oh, never does. And no. I've tried to not do that. And uh, but I think the cure, if someone is struggling with that, is gratitude. If yes. You, if you if you see first of all, if you see the people you work with as special and important and uh, kind of rare and wonderful, uh, that helps too. But I think the biggest thing is. You know, I get to write songs for a living. Right. That's so rare. Uh, I heard a guy in the music business say one time, there's fewer people doing that for a living than are playing pro football. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I couldn't believe yeah. it, but I think it may be true because there's so many teams now. But um, So I, I'm, I am grateful to get to do it. And I think gratitude is, you know, but gratitude also shows you, 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 you don't leave treasure. Right. And I think, you know, in a lot of the journey we've been on the last few years and even here in Nashville, sometimes just being aware of it and being consciously grateful of things lets you realize, oh, there's an opportunity here to do something exciting or to do something I never thought I would do or something I feel insecure about doing. I've I've kind of taken, if I feel a little afraid about doing it, I've decided I should probably do it. That may be the signal for me that it's the path, you know? So, um, so I just think that the gratitude, um, I just think what you're doing there is exceptional. And I know when we first got to be friends and you were sharing that with me and you gave me a coin. Yes. Uh-huh. And, yeah. uh huh. And uh, I keep it still. Oh, it's good. really important glad, yeah. to me. And well, when we locked down and we weren't going to the office anymore, I went and got my football too. You gave oh, me a, okay. a football, right. game ball. And so I brought it to my office at home. Very so I cool. Have it. So, I mean, I really do think um, 
it, it would, I could fill a long time because the whole journey to get to Nashville, the journey to succeed in Nashville. Right. Um, there's, all, there's a saying that in Nashville, the town has to want you to win. Okay. You know, they because they, it's a networking business. Yes. And not in a cheap, easy way, but in a very personal way. A very tight knit way. I very think you said as well. Because really, um, Lori getting here to write, you getting here to write, Jennifer getting here to write. Also, yeah. That's that is not the norm, is it? Not the norm. I mean, honestly, I'm sorry to say, but uh, for most people, it's it, it it is a very hard journey. Very few people make it through. A lot of people get signed to write. Very few people have hits, and right. uh, and the world you know keeps changing. And so it's it's. It's an astounding thing to get to do. Yeah, it's well, a real pressure. I can imagine. I'm going to unpack a little bit of that real quick, and then we're going to move on because I want to talk about the songwriters okay. a bit that we did in Pittsburgh. But you know, uh, April 17th, 2005, I wrote my life mission statement. The last two um, caveat, the last two pillars of that were: I'll touch people positively long after I've left this earth, and I'll help all realize that they're not defined by the jobs they have, but by the emotions they stir. And that's what I hear you saying about your eighth grade teacher, about the, the, the guy that, that taught you different instruments, so about them getting you into the play, about you writing songs to others and things like that is, uh, to me, those two things espouse what you're doing, which I, I commend you for, because uh, trust me, you know, I'm just like everybody else, folks, which is when I heard he was a songwriter, I was like, oh, well, I've got a song kind of brewing. I and I started rhyming, and I sent you something, and, you know, and yeah, you're powerful. like, yeah, I'll sit with that a little bit, and we'll see. And, and you know, just kind of funny and whatever. And, and that was the last one I sent, by the way. <laughs> um, but, uh, That's not right. <laughs> but, That's not fair. But it's pretty funny. But, yours. Um, yeah, gratitude. what you do, I, I think, is so special. You, I mean, it's, it's the arts that you're so, so into. People are surprised to hear that, you know, after playing 15 years in league in the NFL, that really might, and, and being on the broadcast for 12 with the Chiefs Radio Network, my love is the arts. I was in a, mm -hmm. the musicals all four years. I was in show choir. Uh, I, I played the, I played the, I dabble in the piano and I play the saxophone. And uh, I love, I mean, this is my Super Bowl, being able to come in and, and, wow. and get into your world. So, okay, so we talked about gratitude. Uh, let's talk about making a difference a, a little bit. You know, my whole mantra is hashtag, it's a hashtag world, make a difference. About three or four years ago, uh, really kind of at the, the bequest of, of, of your mom a little bit, wanting to, to bring everybody mm -hmm. to town sometime, uh, you got a group and we had some folks come and get you on, on the jet and we did the songwriters uh, night at the Bicknell yeah, Center in, right. in Pittsburgh, Kansas, sold it out. It was phenomenal. Just talk about that. It was for Ronald McDonald House. Yeah. Can, can you talk about that a little bit of the experience? Um, why Ronald McDonald House? And then we'll get into some other personal things. Well, my mother is on the board of Ronald McDonald House, but she's probably affiliated with them most of all because we stayed there. Yes. Uh, when Catherine was born, uh, you know, it was, you know, I'd put money in that little thing, you know, at, Ron, at McDonald's, yeah. you know, but I never thought about it. Right. I'm not going to lie. And maybe there, I feel like the NFL had a game every year, maybe an Eagles game where <clears throat> they would talk about the, mm -hmm. the Ronald McDonald House. But, I, you know, I really was, you know, like most people, I think, we don't think about things until they come into our, we right. got a lot to do. So right. until they get in our world. And disability can be like that, lots of things like that. And um, uh, so we, you know, Catherine was born. Uh, after a few days, they say she's going to be in the hospital. She's born in October. She's probably going to be in the hospital till February. I could not wrap my head around that. We were living in Pittsburgh. Joplin is 30 minutes away. So I'm going, well, do we move to Joplin? How do we, right. do we just do the run back and forth? Uh, we're trying to sort that out. I'm like, and Jennifer is saying, I'm not leaving my child. Right. I'm, I'm not leaving. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, this is not good. In, in walks uh, the social worker there at Freeman, and she says, well, I assume you may need uh, housing at the Ronald McDonald House, which is right across the parking lot here. Wow. And it was really emotional, but I kept it together for a minute. And, and so then I grabbed my brother, mm -hmm. 14 years younger. I said, you got to go with me because I was so nervous, you know, and I don't know. I just couldn't handle much more. And yeah. So we walk over there and it's this beautiful place. Um, you know, the family that owned the McDonald's over in, 
in the Joplin area. They that was really their passion to right. build that, and and Annette was running it, and and so you go in, it smells like cookies, and there's playrooms for Alex, and there's mm-hmm. a kitchen, and there's a suite, and it's nice, and it's right there, and it was really moving, and I'm trying to keep it together and be right. the, the dude, and and uh, she's like, and here's a pager, and here's a this, and here's that, and you'll stay here, and. It was just like they had thought of everything. People I'd never met Mm -hmm. had been working for over a decade for this day when I needed help. Right. And I had the weight of the beauty of that. Mm -hmm. And then she said, also, Coke is one of our sponsors. So Cokes are a quarter. And I started crying. And it wasn't because I like Coke that much. Right, no. It was just, I couldn't take any more. Yep. Sometimes it is the beautiful that, it, that really is impossible for me to resist. Yep. So it had been such a big deal. And then mom got on the board and she, she loves it so much. And a lot of people in Pittsburgh are in the situation I was in. Right. Where they're, they need to stay there at Ronald McDonald House. And, but a lot of times when there's fundraisers, they're over in Joplin. They yes. do the tree at the mall and they do all yep. those things. So my mother, who has never asked for anything really, she says to me, I want you to do a concert. I want it to be at the Bicknell, the new Bicknell place that had just been open a little yes. while. And I want you to, to do a songwriter thing and raise money for Ronald McDonald House. Yeah, this is kind of in the genre of Tim Pan South. That's right. right? It's, it's it's just some Where writers. writers. We sit in a row or yes. in a circle, and we play our songs. It's mm-hmm. not a fancy show. There's no dancing numbers or anything normally, mm-hmm. um, but uh, but it it we just it's a you know it's just sort of an authentic uh, singer songwriter tell the story behind the song play the song kind of experience, and uh, gives you kind of a look behind that world. But this is my hometown. I really. Uh, had never played a show in my hometown. Right. And um, so I didn't, so I literally said to mom, how much do you want to raise? And I'll just give you a check. And she said, you don't have that much money. And uh, so, so she really was adamant about it. And right. she knew Lori and she wanted Lori and I knew Jen, and she loves Jen Shot, And so mm-hmm. we wanted Jen. And, and then Luke Laird was my best buddy. So, that was, we decide, okay, we'll do it. I thought nobody would come. I'm not going to lie. And I really thought... I understand why. I mean, yeah, it, it, you, I you can logically understand why it was sold out, but keep going. I, I also thought they might not like it. That's what I kept saying is, if they've never been around this, it's very strange. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's very quiet, and you sit there, and it's, it's a very different experience, I think. Right, I agree. And uh, so I was really nervous about it. But you were pushing it, and with Mom, and, and then, you, then the sponsors came on board and made it where we could get Lori and Luke and everybody there and back. Yeah, I mean, just to unpack that a little bit. I mean, we, we had two different companies. We won't them, but because they prefer not to be named. But yeah. we had two different companies. One get the leg to go out there and pick you all up, and the yes. other one to take them back. Uh, that doesn't happen everywhere. No. Pittsburgh is a special place. Very special place. And, and it really was, uh, it was a very special <clears throat> night. I mean, it, I, I, so much money was raised for Ronald McDonald House. Also, it was wonderful. Uh, uh, Mom and some other friends helped coordinate uh, before the show. Uh, Mr. Harry was yes. there, and uh, we, we had a lot of family friends that I'd grown up with, and, mm-hmm. and teachers that had helped me so much, or put up with me, maybe is a better way to say it, and um, so we got to hug a lot of necks and say thank you, and, and that right. was wonderful, and then, but it was really, and you could tell, I'm sure, it was really for me, uh, very emotional, I grew up with a guy, uh, Robert Brock, he, uh, Colonel Brock, and, and he's a uh, He's been my friend since uh, I don't know first second grade probably and uh, right and um, so it had been a long week. We had the BMI awards I think Tuesday and the uh, or maybe it was Wednesday and and then the CMA and then and then unfortunately my very close friend Rod Dutton had passed away so his funeral was Thursday. Oh, I didn't. And know I that. officiated his funeral. Oh, wow! And uh, no, I'm not qualified for that. That was my one and done. I don't yes. know what I did to make him angry that he asked me to do it. And uh, <laughs> that's what I told his wife, which he shared. It. And um, so then Friday we got ready, and then Saturday was the show. And uh, but I was so excited because of their providing the transportation to yeah. Luke and and Lori and Jen, uh, Jennifer Shot and my Jennifer and I, we got to say. 
welcome to Pittsburgh. We're going to the deli. Now we're going to go to a football game. Yes. Now we're going to come over here and we're going to have... We actually, this is so foo foo, but we had Jim's and Chicken Mary's. Oh, nice! So they could take. We wanted them to do that, and there was a there was an argument because uh, Jim shots a Pickler's Chicken Annie's person. I'm not against them. I love Pickler's Chicken, <laughs> Annie. but we had Chicken Mary's and Jim, so there was a whole debate testing onion rings. Yes, and um, so it was a it was a really. I got to share a little of the town with them, which made me really happy. It, it was it was so much fun to sit back there and watch it and watch everything come together. And again, it's because of the great people around there. Yes. And, and, you know, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up because you've been all around. You've performed a lot of different places. And I mean, I think it was a little bit of a proud moment to be able to take uh, Luke and Lori and, and um, Jen into the Bicknell Center. That's oh. a special place. Yeah, I hadn't been in it. I know. And I, it was stunning. It's just, and they were just like, they couldn't believe. I mean, it's just, it is an, ama- it's an amazing gift to the town. I mean, and to us as a performer, yeah. you sit down and you're in that space and it really created, um, I was just so worried that, it wouldn't translate the songwriter thing, right. and it. I felt like it did. It, it really did. Tell. And uh, and it was really uh, surreal. When I first got out on stage, um, I was uh, I was just trying to process it. Right. And and I keep my phone on my music stand uh-huh. in case somebody needs to say, "Don't forget to say this," or and it had notes to right. make sure everybody got because there were so many people who'd helped yes. so much, and. Um, and my friend Bob could see it. He has known me my whole life. And he texted, okay, let's go. Like, I see you're locked up. That is sweet. Now let's move along. <laughs> and it really helped me. You can, you That's got, funny. I saw some of the little tape of it. And, and you can see me just like this. And then all of a sudden, I look down. And then I look up and I'm like, okay, we're doing this. And it was a great night. Yeah, well, I, I think you're being a little bit harder on yourself, uh, like we always are. But y- y- you have a gift of, of holding a crowd. You're like me. You love the self-deprecating humor. <laughs> you move <laughs> things around. I, you know, I've talked, you know, I've somewhat when I've been at a table and talked with Luke or, or Beth or, or, or uh, some of the others, they love the fact of how you how you were able to pull things along. And, and I, I know you've heard that before, but folks, I'm telling you, if you ever get a chance to see them, it, it, it's, it's phenomenal. So we've kind of got into that. And, you know, the, the Ronald McDonald House and what it does. And, and, and I, can, I can only, I can identify with that a little bit because both my boys were in uh, NICU at birth for, oh. for two weeks. Oh, yeah. But... For four or five months, well, and what, whatever. The meters, but, but, I, but I, yeah, exactly. Right after the point, you're like, what the heck? But but that's that, that's brought to light some things of you making a difference, and um, I mean, everything that you seem to do, I, I, I think, is just done with such passion and, and goodwill. And I, I just think that's a beautiful beautiful thing. I mean, uh, you've what. I know at one point you'd written at least 1,500 songs, and yeah. I think it's over think that now. Right. Yeah. And you continue to do that, but you've, you've got some other things going on that I, I think is amazing. Because we talked about making a difference. That's where I was getting at, and I go on tangents every once in a while. But we talked about the Ronald McDonald House, and of course, Catherine, who, who had the, 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 the physical issues. And that really, in a way, led you uh, today to today, which started years ago in terms of uh, uh, something that you're making a difference with, along with some other folks, uh, which is Lucy. Oh, yeah. uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, Lucy is a company uh, we make, uh, we help make wheelchairs smart, specifically mm-hmm. power wheelchairs. Um, and some people ask, well, why didn't you just make a invent a new power wheelchair. Right. And we felt like the power part, you know, the motor and the wheels and all, there's a lot of good choices, but they're right. all really, you know, there's not a brain on them to hack. If we could have just hacked it and done the things, uh, we, we would have done the easy way. But it, we had a friend, my friend Troy Virgis that I write with. Yes. Um, uh, you've met Troy. He, his mother is in the same model chair as my daughter. Okay. And um, she's just a wonderful woman. And, and she took a ramp just a little high and 
had a horrible injury. These chairs, the MSRP on these chairs are like a Tesla. They're seventy, eighty thousand right. dollars. They weigh three to four hundred and fifty pounds, three hundred to four hundred fifty pounds, plus the person. Yes. And um, and the only thing they've got on it as a safety thing is the seatbelt. Which okay, so let's stop right there for a second. Which it boggles my mind because some of this stuff I would have assumed had already been invented. I, you know, I went back and, and studied a little bit. You guys talk about. Uh, you, you referenced 2010, where there were 170,000 wheelchair accidents, 30 of which put folks in the hospital. 30,000. That's that's, right. that's significant. Significant. It's significant to begin with, let alone if you're the mother, the father, the brother, sibling, whoever, and you watch somebody who's already having a rough time being in a power wheelchair. Yeah, getting and around. Be, yeah. and, and now they can't do this stuff. So they keep going. T to me, that boggles the mind. We really thought, Jared and I, you know, Jared's the, I always say Jared's the 64 crayons with the sharpener, and I'm the three you get at Applebee's. And uh, so I really thought, and so did Jared, we're going to find... A different, a different brand right. that will have safety features. All of and, this. You know, collision avoidance, drop-off protection, yes. tip warning, connectivity to Alexa, just those kinds of things. Right. You know, just Apple Watch connectivity. Yes. And we couldn't find it. And so I thought, well, it's me. I'm not doing my research right. So I called Jared. Jared researches. He goes, I can't find it. So we go to the International Seating Symposium, and we meet these companies, and it turns out they're not, they don't have it. And they're not doing it. And I think part of it was, I think part of it is they live in a, uh, it's, a it's a cycle, you know, if, if you want to, the insurance to pay for something, right. then, then you need to say, well, it has a code and a payment right. for that. Mm -hmm. um, if there isn't a code for it, no one will build it or create R&D for it. Right. Well, if you don't create it, you can't get a code, right? We can't give codes to things that don't exist. Right. So they had just sort of locked that industry. It was the chicken and egg. Chicken uh, and egg. Everybody's sort of in a... And it's not that there weren't good people. There are good people. Right. right? And they, they wanted these things. Mm -hmm. But who's going to do it? Who's going to do the hard work? Who's going to pay to do it? Who's going to break the this? Right. And uh, we did not want to be that person, but we couldn't find it. We knew we needed it. And again, going back to gratitude, doors were open. Julie Bowes, who grew up in Hiawatha, Kansas. Wow. Um, she, um, I went and asked her advice on what I should do about this, uh -huh. right? And she said that she's in the music business, very successful uh, as a uh, business manager and leader. Right. And uh, she said, you know, I don't know, but my uncle Rick has a lot of patents in GPS and precision agriculture. and Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And gotcha. so she puts us in touch with him. He sends us to Seattle to the folks that helped create OnStar for Cadillac. Oh, wow. And so all of a sudden doors are opening to allow us uh, access and, and education and teammates, if you will, counsel, yes. that most people don't get access to. Right. And if you're not grateful for it, then right. you don't realize, oh, these doors are opening and I need to treat these as valuable and, and, uh, and, and really honor it. I think gratefulness does open up doors and invite more yeah. uh, goodwill in. And so they, they began, we began the process of creating intellectual property and filing patents and, and doing R&D and product designs, again, hoping that uh, we wouldn't have to stand up a company to do it. We right. really saw it as, we'll help Catherine, we'll help Catherine's friends, and we'll move it on down the, the road. And of course, this only took a couple months, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was long. This than goes we back four or five years yeah, when we first met. It, you, yeah. you had the idea. That's why I'm talking about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, this a was a process. Time. It was a long process. I would literally, uh, Jared and I would fly to Seattle, him from Colorado and me from here, and we'd work out there and then we'd fly back and I'd write songs. And then right. the next weekend we'd fly there and work some more. And it was a, you know, it was that time of the of the world where you could travel around Southwest Airlines. I could, yes. I'm a frequent, I get all the peanuts I want. Uh, there and, you go. Uh, and, uh, or pet pretzels now, or I think, I don't know what it is now. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so we're doing that, and then at a certain point, uh, through a bunch of circumstances, we realize if this is going to happen, we're going to have to be the ones that do it. Right. Um, and I, I should say, you know, you know I'm grateful for right now, uh, and just thinking of them, is my mom and dad, because, you know, my dad cared so much about teachers and yes. students. And I think a lot of people care about 
education writ large, or they care about student individual. But he cared about teachers. Right. And he knew if he could help teachers, they would help the kids. Yeah, well, and, and going to that, talk about your father's company real quick, yeah, he has just a, so people understand. He has a company he founded with uh, two other teachers and uh, that sold, it sold industrial arts supplies originally. Okay. And then, um, and he's owned other companies, but, the, but that's what we're talking about. And then he, he moved that into what they called technology education, which was the early precursor to STEM. Basically, yes. you're seeing robotics and applied physics. And so you're starting to see science and technology and engineering, breaking of bridges. And he, right. he was at the forefront of all of that. Okay. And so, so now that company would be known as a STEM curriculum. Which company. is Pitsco, correct? Pitsco, yeah. Pitsco. Gotcha. And, and, uh, but they, you know, he also had a hand in founding Lego's education division and right. making that successful. And, but, but he, as a young guy, when he was working so hard and traveling, because they worked so hard, yeah, uh, I didn't understand it. I didn't get it. It seemed, uh, it seemed like he was away a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, it bothered me. Yep. Um, and 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 it bothers him too. So I, I hesitate to talk about it because I, you know, he. I don't want him to ever hear that uh, negatively. But but the fact of the matter is, the Lucy thing Jared and I are on. Mm -hmm. We suddenly recognized that our parents had given us the uh, how to do this 101 class. If you're going to change the world a little better, make it a little better the way you can. You know, that's interesting. So Steve Jobs has a quote, which is, you can't connect the dots going forward. You can only look back and mm. see that the dots connect. And it tells, I feel like that's what you're doing. That's right. You're looking back, you're like, okay, I see how this connected to this yeah. and how that affected that. Is that right? So much of what we've done in Lucy, we were able to look at Pitsco and there was a division called Synergistic Systems where they revolutionize things and go, oh, this is... This is like that thing that we saw. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I was one of those guys that was, when I was young, I was uh, super arrogant and super angry about things. And, uh, and when you're in that place and you're not feeling grateful and you're not being open, uh, you can't see the resources you have. Right. Sometimes the resources you have cost you something and that's, you know, that's for a different mm -hmm. counseling session. But... Uh, but at least acknowledge what you do have. Yes. At least know that I do have these tools on the belt as you go forward. And we suddenly realized that Lucy, and certainly they taught us lots of other things that have helped our families and our kids. And, you know, I mean, we're grateful for them. But with Lucy specifically, we realized them and their companies were giving us a template as a way to help Catherine, all her friends, and begin to make a change in this area of seating and mobility. Right. And uh, so, so I think the last several years, especially the last two or three, I felt <clears throat> enormous gratitude to them, not just as parents and, and for their love, but, right. but, but golly, the way they ran those companies and, and, mm -hmm. and what they were trying to do, I suddenly could see it maybe more for the first time through my dad's eyes as I have a way I have these resources. I don't know how I got them. I feel fortunate that I got them. And I can help those teachers. I just need to do these things to help those teachers and work hard. We were suddenly in the same place. We have these resources and these relationships, and we're very grateful for them. And we see a way we could help this little seating and mobility industry uh, progress. We could break the tie. Yeah, and affect people positively long yeah. after you've left this earth. That's right. Which I think is beautiful. So, right. you know, things have really come to fruition as of late. Yeah. Time top 100 inventions of the year. Talk Crazy. about that. I we, mean, that's amazing. Yeah, we announced in June. You know, you, you, you launch a company in the middle of a pandemic. That's not the way you were drawn up on the board. But again, you know, you, you do what you need to do. Right. Um, we were going to come out earlier. Uh, then we held to see what would happen. We kind of hunkered down, kept our team together, very small company. Right. And then at the end of the year, all of a sudden, we had the Popular Science Award, which my brother loves the most, you know, because he read it. Because of the engineering, right? Yeah, he read it his whole life. Oh, he's, yeah. He's always had a subscription. And then Time 
stunned us, you know, and, and uh, we were really shocked. And then CES just announced. Oh, did they? Yeah, I did Consumer not know that. Electronics, we just won one of their top innovations for Consumer Electronics Show, which will be in January. That so, is amazing. So we, we were really, and you know, the Mobility Trade Magazine, uh, uh, Mobility Management, uh, they gave us, they were the first award, you know, they okay. gave us a, a, an award and, and created an entire category because what we were doing was was different, you know. It's a it's a it's a it's a strange thing, and I know that, and Jared knows that. But but we've really enjoyed working together. It's easier for me. It's harder for him. He has to deal with me. But uh, <laughs> but we've but we've the whole family, you know, Krista, my sister, and her husband, and I mean, the whole family sort of made a decision that this is an area we can affect change right it's it's we think it's in our power to do it and we're going to choose to do it and so we've felt uh, Jared and I not speak for him but we have felt support from this our entire family in doing this and in a unification in a way that I'm not sure we'd ever done it that way we always love each other and support each other like families do but we're doing our thing and they're doing their thing and but this one area uh, we have you know lots of conversations about it and, and they're we feel their support. I know Jared and I do. It's got to be enormously gratifying. And then, and then folks, if you don't know, I mean, because we've talked about your songwriting side of it, you've still been doing that. I mean, you helped uh, You helped write, I think, Heartache, Heartache, Heartache Medication, Medication with John yeah. Party. Yeah. Um, just uh, fairly recently, I, I think you helped uh, maybe with Luke uh, uh, through my Ray-Bans yeah, with, Eric, with Church. Eric Church. And yeah. those may be some uh, performers you've heard yeah, of before. Yeah, I've, you know, you think about the through my Ray-Bans and, and you're looking through the glasses and what you see. I mean, when you look at your life and what you've done, and I know you're very humble about it, but you, we just talked about how you've, you're affecting things with Lucy, and that's only going to get bigger and broader, I believe. I hope so. But, but the songs you've written, the emotions you've evoked, um, do you ever stop and just think about it and think, you know what? I'm really proud of that. I don't mean in a boastful way, but I, I think that's something you've moved people in ways. I mean, we all know that songs create anchors and, and you know, these songs you've been involved with have created, created anchors for a lot of people. Yeah. I, I, I do think songs kind of hold, I said this before, songs kind of hold memories for us. Yes. Um, they're an easy way of getting to them. And, um, so I will say it like this, when I hear songs on the radio, um, it's harder for me to have an, em, an emotional reaction because my the Cause business I'm in is yeah. uh, you know that kind of thing. But when and I know it's been a long time, but when you go to a concert and people are choosing to sing a song you wrote, it is the most overwhelming, uh, humbling but beautiful. It you never feel that good. I mean, it's so good a feeling when you go to a show right. and they sing it. Um, because you realize, oh, they chose, they chose this song, right? You know, and um, and that's really moving to me. That that's what drives you is that feeling of like right. connecting to other people, and um, and finding some way to do that. And and you know, I mean, we're we're all missing live music. I think uh, certainly we are at the DMS. Yes, but um, but that's where I feel it most. Not on the radio. That's where I go feel um, like. Uh, what's going on there and I am still writing you know uh, there's probably not a more I tease my co-writers that they're dealing with a puppy because um, <laughs> you know you, you spend all day in zoom meetings and working on this and, and yep. you know seating and mobility wonderful clinicians and wonderful people but there's also this just lots of paperwork and lots of you know smart people things and uh, so I get pretty tired and um, you know I want to see the change um, uh, I, and I understand we're doing it differently. So, you know, all day you're sort of pushing the rock a little bit. Right. And then the next day you get a window where you get to write songs. It becomes an escape for you, oh, doesn't it? Oh, I, and I am, I know I'm just irritating because I'll like, let's write another one. Let's write another one. I'm just so excited to write. <laughs> and, um, and I've kept a lot of, we talked about this before we started. I've kept a lot of my rituals. I mean, just like yes. anything, you know, it's preparation and, uh -huh. you know, you do research and you're reading and you're writing and you're preparing for what's going to happen. And, and, uh, I have found it, uh, I probably love songwriting more now mm -hmm. than I did 
two, three years ago, because at that time, that's all I was focused on, and you can get pretty close to the tree and yep. the bark. And uh, Well, you, and you would talk to me about sometimes you called it going into the cave, and mm. for one, two, three weeks at a time, there is no outside contact. You're just writing, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, just in the zone. Yeah, you're just trying to stay focused and write where you're at and keep moving forward. And we're normally writing songs out a way. So it could right. be six months, but it could be two, three years. Right. You know, I had a song, uh, Brett Eldridge put out an album this year, uh-huh. and Sunday Drive, that song was written 12 years ago. That's and amazing. It was never recorded. It was never released. And so, so but he, he heard it when he was working as a tape copy guy. How about that? And has kept it with him. First of all, what an honor that is. I was going to say, it's probably astounding to you. You're like, no way this happens. Couldn't believe it. I got a text from him before, you know, before the album came out, maybe six months before. He texted and said, we just cut the most beautiful version of Sunday Drive. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> you know, I didn't even, you know, I didn't like, know. I'm not even sure if I remember all the words yeah, to it. Yeah, <laughs> it was really something. And, and he, of course, now it's his song. He just made it his song. It's so yep. wonderful. But... Um, but yeah, songs do take their own route. Yes. And one of the things I had to learn when I came to Nashville that probably helped me uh, psychologically was there was a moment where I had to realize, I don't know. I, I, I have opinions. Yeah. I have thoughts. I'm certainly doing my best. But if I look at the top 10 songs I have, uh-huh. I, the one thing they have in common is I didn't think they would get cut. That's interesting. Because pontoon was too crazy. Right. Day drinking was too on the nose. 1994 was ridiculous. No one's going to record that. Diamond Rings is too country. God's Will is too sad, too personal, and structured incorrectly. Um, You know, I could just go on and on. And for the most part... um, if I'm honest, and that's right. not how we tell the story now. Oh, I heard it. We thought it'd be great. For, but, <laughs> exactly. You know, that's it. Let's get playing my guitar. And, uh, but, but being honest, Jennifer is who helped me see, like, these are the songs that have had the most success. They've had this many streams, and they've had this many, you know, this is gold, and that's platinum. Right. And I was like, what, what do they have in common? Right. And the more I, real, I, the more I looked at it, the more I was like, you know what? There were reasons why I doubted each of these songs. I still wrote them. I still right. did my best. But I, in, in my head, I thought, I don't know. I don't know. But I stayed true in the room to doing the work. And then the song proved me wrong. Right. And the audience proved me wrong. And when I got that, which was seven years ago, I would love to tell you it was way back at the right. beginning. But when, that, when I let that inside that it wasn't my job to know all of the... Because so much of it right. is when the artist feels like it, when their yes. manager feels like it, what's going on in the world at the time. And so um, I just turned loose of that. Right. And I thought, I, I will always do my best. I will always be in the room and present. And I will, and I will try to be truthful. I'll try to write from the journal, even right. if it's funny. That's the other thing I had to come up with was... My early songs were all heavy, sad songs. I was kind of known for that. Right. And then uh, one day I made a comment. Someone said, have you heard this such and such song? I said, it's so sad. I I don't really like to listen to sad songs very much. (laughs) And they were like, wait, what? You know, wait, I'm sorry. You know, uh, that seems weird. And uh, I was like, I like to listen to fun songs. Yeah. And they were like, what? And so just seeing their reaction... I started thinking, what's going on there? Am I cutting off part of me? Right. Uh, because, because you you think you have to to be in a mold. I, I think people can learn something from that, which is you don't have to be anything except what you are. That's right. Yeah. You, you and and the and the more you allow all of you, like you talking about music. First of all, I have to say this: I've never met people who love music more than great athletes. I would agree because it stirs something in us. I mean, we've had the joke, and you know, people laughed about me my whole career. If you could hear in, inside, and people could look at whatever is going on, I listen to safety dance before the game. <laughs> Men without hats, I don't know if they won any Grammys. I'm going to guess they did not. But it, it moves I know me. That song, I mean, yeah. there's some songs like that. I've got some other songs that are more classic, but yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. Athletes do get into their music, they love me. It's like an emotional 
language for them. Uh -huh. They understand that emotion. Mm -hmm. And that's what songwriters are living on. And of course, songwriters are fascinating. I mean, songwriters love sports. Musicians love sports. And so there is this cross-pollination. I don't know why. I, at least maybe it was just me. But I felt when I was young, it was kept separate. Right. But but I think there is a cross-pollination because um, there's also... It is much more emotional. You know, I used to hear announcers like so say um, they need to get that wide receiver in the game early, right? Or they'll lose him. Get him into the zone. Get him feeling it. Absolutely. Feeling. And mm -hmm. and and I would think, <clears throat> what? I understand more because of my experiences in Nashville with the musicians and writing, as much as is possible to jump that divide. I go. I understand it because in a writing room. I, we have to make sure we get everybody in the room right. and get everybody doing what they do to get the magic to happen. So you bring up an interesting point with that, which is I've, I've, when I've had a chance to, to speak a little bit with Lori, or, or it was, I think it was more Luke, one thing they talked about they love when they're writing with you is you're, you start drawing things out of others. It, uh -huh. It's not so much about you, it's about the song and what you're going. Because they said, yeah, I mean, Barry will be like, okay, well, what, I, what I'm hearing you say is this. or mm -hmm. uh, So is this what you're thinking? And you've talked to me about that as well because... You know, country music is a genre. You're one of the one of uh, I think a select few. I think Luke has done it also, which is you, you've crossed over into some pop or some yeah. alternative. You've you've written with Borns, which is a favorite group of yeah. mine, or I guess person. And yeah. that stuff to me is mesmerizing. I think you think it's neat that I've played in the Super Bowl. I broadcast the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, I do. And I think <laughs> that what you do is one million times more interesting uh, than what I've done, which yeah. I think is the beauty. Uh, of life and also maybe a lesson to learn, which is if you do anything for too long, uh, sometimes it's easy to take it for granted. You don't understand right. what you really have. I know that's happened to me, you know, in my, in, in my life in, in certain different genres. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, we're looking for, in songwriting, for instance, we're looking for something um, so hard that our friends or people who are there to help us uh, can see it. You know, you said this, and I think that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Well, I've always said that. It is still, <laughs> it's still the, the coolest, coolest thing I've ever heard. And, oh, really? Doesn't everybody say that? Never heard it. How about you? Never heard it. Okay. <laughs> Would you consider that that yep. thing that you're familiar with right. is actually incredible? I, I have said this, and I, I don't know if this will come off. I hope it doesn't come off wrong. I said once, the things that made me crazy in my hometown... Right. As you know, in a small town, you grew up there, everybody knows you. The things that made you kind of crazy or weird or different are all the things I get paid for now. Right. And there's there's a lot about that. And I would imagine, you know, there's an intensity level with which we approach things. Yes. That was uh, perhaps frowned upon at a lot of large times. You mm -hmm. know I mean? And I get it. I'd probably do the same thing with my kids if I was, you know, I, I have to pay attention to that. Right. Because cause you're like, you need to be less, stop thinking about that all the time. Stop to, you know, but then you But like, it's hard. If, if that's your passion and that's what you like, it's hard to turn it off. I, I have no doubt that... I mean, because for me, you know, I have the ability to, I, I'm lucky enough to speak all over the country. If, if it's the night before, or if I have thoughts at night of something new that would be nice, I can't go to sleep. I mean, yeah. forget about it. Might as well get up and have some coffee because we're done. Yeah, I'm getting ready. Yeah, and that's true in rights, and that's true with what we're doing. I mean, you know, that's, and that's a good sign, really. I mean, just approaching it, you know, what's the old plaque say about, you know, if you care more than others think is prudent or wise, if you, you know, those kind kinds of things, you know, you're demanding more. What, why are we doing it? How can we do it better? What, what's the goal? Well, if this is the goal, right. of course, I think one of the hardest questions I had to answer, and this may be true for other people, is what do you want? Yes. You know, there's, a, there's an element, because you say, oh, I want to be this. Okay, what does that mean? And they really don't know. See, they don't really know. I didn't know. I, I would agree. I, I was the same. And so once you start going, you know, and that's what Jennifer was doing to me. Uh, when we were talking about jobs all the way back. Right. What do you want? Well, I, I immediately threw up my hands. Well, it doesn't matter what I Wait, who, who's it going to matter to if it doesn't matter to me? Well, and you and I are very similar in that. Um, and we've talked about this over uh, uh, dinners sometimes, which is we want to please everybody. 
and then you forget about yourself. Yeah. Uh, and and I mean, we're not trying to make ourselves out as a martyr, but I think that's something that a lot of people do. They, they want to be perfect. They want to help everybody else, which is great. But if you don't help yourself first, yeah. um, then eventually you're going to run out of that, what I call emotional oxygen. It's like, you know, Good when point. you go up on a plane and they, they talk about in the sudden loss of cabin pressure and the mass drops and the oxygen is flowing, um, they don't tell you to put it on everybody else first. They tell you to take care of yourself first because then you can take care of that's others. Right. And that's what I liken it, it, it to with this. Yeah, that's a great way of saying that. I mean, I think that's, that's so important. It's, you know... A lot of the journey, you know, for this, there have been times, I will also say this, where I've wrestled with, you know, like, you know, to, and I'm sure that you've had to go through these same things where you go, well, this is going to take an enormous amount of time away from my family. It's, right. And the mind share of doing this, taking the risks um, is a huge you know, it's a thing. Yes. It's a thing. Um, but, but that's where Jennifer's sort of philosophy on it is your kids have to see that things <clears throat> matter to you, that there right. are values at stake here. And, there are th- and we try to do a good job balancing it. She's great, but, right. but I'm not great. I'm doing better. I'm trying, you know, uh, but, uh, but it, 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 is, it, it requires planning for us to do it. And, I would agree. I mean, because people talk about, because you know, what I hear you saying is people always talk, I hear it, you know, life balance, life balance. Well, I would submit there's no really such thing as true life balance. There's healthy life imbalance. Yeah. But being able to understand of what, whether you're in your, your personal space, whether you're in your friends and family space, or if you're in your professional space. Yeah. And when you're there, you're, you're all in. So it's imbalanced, but it's healthy in the fact that once you get out of there, you can give it, get back to something else. Yeah. The, uh, the example I always give is when my, when my youngest son was in the hospital, um, I was playing a game at, at the Superdome in New Orleans. Well, if I, I mean, that's that's a that's a personal thing, that's a family thing, but if I'm not completely focused on my job at hand and what I'm doing on the field, that's eventually going to affect the other two in, a, in an adverse way. So when you are a certain place, you've really got to hone in, which is I think what you do when you go into the the cave. The yeah. cave, absolutely. Yeah. There are times where we'll look at the calendar, Jen and I will look through what we're doing and be like, we know this is here, but I need. And she'll kind of help me map out. Right. We need to only think about this here, then think about this here, and then I'll have it ready, and we'll be a family and do these things here. And and you know, being able to communicate and do that is uh, is life changing. It is interesting. I, I don't know why I just thought of this guy. Uh, the there was a banker in Pittsburgh, Wendell Wilkinson. He used to oh, yeah. say. Um, about and I like him because he's a real dry sense of humor. And, he does, uh, and um, he gave one of the greatest eulogies I've ever heard in my life. And you know, I mean, and I would put it up there. I don't know if you've read uh, uh, Ted Kennedy's eulogy for Robert Kennedy was uh, phenomenal. And um, but he eulogized uh, another banker in town who had passed okay. away, and um, and it was the most beautiful thing. I, I you know I went to the funeral and. And I saw he was going to speak. And that guy, I mean, honestly, and I've had to do, I'm sorry to say, a few eulogies in my life. Right. And I hold, I'm always trying to figure out how to make it more like what Wendell, I wouldn't, you know, he just kind of, it was one of those kind of amazing things that had, he gave people a chance to breathe. He spoke love into the children. He, right. It was, and it was a difficult room, and I just think it was great. Anyway, my point is, uh, but he has sort of a gruff way of talking. Yeah, he does. Right. I bought my first uh, car uh, that I went and paid, bought a new car right. uh, in 90, and, uh, and I always tease that he was looking over his little peepers, and he went, enjoy it. <laughs> you know, but he said you know, when Wendell watches this, he's going to get kicked. Yeah, out but of when we, uh, when, when my oldest boy was born, he said to me, uh, "Quantity." And I, I said, "Do you have any advice for parents?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, quantity." And I was like, "What?" He goes, "People say quality time. How you judge that? Quantity." That's. And I've thought about him during this whole shelter in place pandemic yes. thing. You know. I can't tell you, you know, we didn't like build an, a wing onto the house, me and the kids. Right. Uh, but, but just the quantity of time, and they're not always with me, and it's not always us yes. making paper mache, you know, castles, you know, or whatever we're supposed to do. But there's just time around one another. 
And again, that's a case where so many people suffering, it's such a disruption, it's horrible, we're all missing family and friends mm -hmm. and all that. Um, at the same time, once I accept this is reality now for now, right? then let's look around, what do I have? Yep. What, what do I have to work with? And one of the things that, that has been, uh, has come out of this that has been good has been the quali quality, but quantity of time with the family. I, I don't think I've ever been in around the family as much. Right. And um, and maybe maybe that'll be one good thing. I yeah. Think. And also the celebration we're going to have when we can all go back and go okay. to games and go to concerts and go to restaurants. And I mean, it's going to be. Yeah, it, it is amazing. It's, you know, everybody's heard the new normal and, and everything, but we're eventually going to get back to normal and it may be new, but it's it'll be closer to what we're with. And the yeah. fact is the only constant is change. And, and, and uh, things are going to change anyhow. We just, they've changed more here recently. So, hey, um, I appreciate you taking time uh, this for this. You've become a good friend. Uh, you're, like I said, you, you talk about time and taking this time out to talk with me and everybody out there. I think people are just going to love hearing about this. Yeah. This is the extra point. One thing either that we didn't talk about that you'd like to or something that you want to go back over again a little. I, I just want to talk about you for a minute. I really appreciate you because because I, you know, we met uh, over the phone. Yes. And instantly had a rapport. Mm -hmm. And um, what what shocked me and you, I'm one of those guys that I thought, oh, I don't know how he'll re you'll feel about me because I'm all talky talky and all this. And of course, you were not the stereo, the cardboard cut out. I think there's fewer and fewer in my life people that I believe are that. Wow. I think, I think, you know, the, you know, that are, that are, you know, it, you made it very clear to me, hey, I want to have an honest conversation. I want to have a real conversation. Right. And right off the bat, then there we were. And I, I hope, I think what you're doing is encouraging people to do that. That changes the culture in a business and it changes it changes it. it makes my life better because of you you know i mean because we're having a real conversation about our kids and what's going on in our lives right and, and your love of music and and how did you navigate this and how did i navigate that um those and maybe it's my age i'm 53 but i i just it matters so much to me now you know just that we're having real conversations that you're stirring up real conversations right and, and that you're encouraging that hey let's let's really cut through some of this because there really are i think very few people who are the cardboard cutout we make them i think exactly most people are are much more complicated. We just, you know, just who's going to take the time? And you always do. I've noticed that even when that first dinner when you came with Lori and everybody, you take that time to meet people and, and pull them in and encourage them. You put wind in their sails. Uh, I'm speechless. I, I appreciate that very, very much. You and I do have a, a kinship, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, we haven't talked for several months, but we get back together. And it's just like we were, it was yesterday. Never went away, yeah. that, that's something special. I would tell you folks out there, if you've got people like that in your life, definitely uh, thank them for it and, and understand that they're making a difference and that you're making a difference. You make a difference. I appreciate everything. Thank you. He is Barry Dean. I am Kendall Gammon, and this has been The Extra Point.